Al Bielik's journey through time started when he jumped off the USS Eldridge in 1943 during the Philadelphia Experiment. Both he and his brother Duncan Cameron landed in the year 2137 and remember waking up in a hospital bed. During that stay, Ed alone traveled to the year 2749 and spent two years there. In this program, Al recounts his memories of that trip. Al, can you describe what the civilization was like in the year 2749? What I saw of this civilization was a highly advanced civilization and technologically. We had floating cities, we had ground-based cities. The floating ones are anti-gravity type flotation. 2100, 2200 stories, like the cities are two and a half miles high. And in retrospect, I looked at that and says, now how the blazes with any materials that we know in the 20th century, how could they build anything that would sustain that kind of weight from the stories above it? And of course, it was explained to me at that time in the 28th century that it was very easy to explain because they had conquered at full control over anti-gravity and multiple systems of anti-gravity in which they built platforms of every 300 floors, approximately, and uh, they would relieve the strain of the pressure from above with an anti-gravity reverse system so that the pressure from above disappeared. So that each section only had to support its own weight. And they kept adding sections as they built this city up to 2,100, 2,200 stories. And in addition, if they wanted the city to be a floating city, it was a floating city. And they would move it around from one part of the earth if they got tired of it to another part of the earth. They were interested in that. And I told them about the system of governing, if you will, which was a totally synthetic uh, system, actually, in synthetic intelligence computers. They were moderately interested in that. And I said they had one in each city. Uh, whether the city was fixed, which there were fixed cities, doing manufacturing and so forth. Well, it was a floating city. Why they had floating cities moving around, I don't know, but that was a civilization as it was then, or is to be, if you will. And I started to ask questions. I had friends there, and I stayed long enough to learn all about the functions of the city and the fact that this synthetic intelligence was a highly radioactive crystal informed structure, so far as I could tell, because I was called in for an interview and to be interviewed you had to put on a lead lined suit with completely radiation proof because in the room where this computer was where you were interviewed which computer if I can call it that was a huge crystalline structure floating in the middle of the room and hmm. uh, no physical connections to anything we could see and it would interview you telepathically and I was called in for more than one interview and I gathered the, the structure of the society at that time was purely socialism, 100% pure socialism, everything was free, uh, there were no banks, there was no money, you were born into the society by your parents, your parents could be living in a common law arrangement, they could be married, you could be raised by your parents or you could be raised by the state. Well what did the computer want to know from you? Uh, eventually wanted to know what I was doing there and what I knew about how I got there. At that point, I didn't remember anything about how I got there. It was sort of like I arrived and became part of this city, part of the society, like I had been born in it, but which was not the case. There was some false memories involved and a huge block as to where I'd been, or how I got there, what was I doing there. And I sort of absorbed the place and became part of me, and I became part of it, so to speak. And, uh, <clears throat> One tour guide I became very friendly with, as I found out much later. Isn't that what we you were? You were a tour guide, weren't you? I became a tour guide of sorts because I adopted this profession. Everybody was expected to get an education, a minimal education, and then, of course, contribute something to society, do something useful. Mm -hmm. But there's manufacturing, being a tour guide, uh, a scientist, an engineer, whatever, manufacturing. What did you give tours of? the city basically to because tourists where people or? came to these cities from elsewhere on the planet mm -hmm. and uh, they would like to see all of the workings particularly the floating cities where did they go what did they do and the, the cities based on the ground had these transportation tubes they called accelerons 
It was sort of like a moving sidewalk. You had one type, which was a moving sidewalk. You jump on a thing and move through the city. You can jump off where you wanted. The other was a tube type apparatus where you jump in the thing and it would propel you, similar to the Montauk operation, but it was a localized, much slower thing in which you were propelled through the tube to a, it's sort of like a continuous belt. You get on it and you get off where you wanted to get off and some other part of the city. The kids used to love this thing. It was, it was entertainment for them. And uh, I became part of a guide for that. We took people from outside that didn't see these things very often, or from another part of the world, and we show them around, show them this particular operation in the city and what was in that city. So that was what the tour guides were for. They literally showed outsiders what was going on in their particular city. Now, obviously, not all the cities were the same. But it was interesting that there was no external structure of government other than the local government of each city. It was a city-state, if you will. I.e., each city was a rule and a law unto itself, though they all followed a common format in terms of the fact that each city was ruled by the synthetic intelligence. And as I found out, each synthetic intelligence unit was connected to the rest. So there was a worldwide network, a worldwide web, if you will. Hmm. Well, I asked a lot of questions. Well, what about war? What's that? Unknown. Well, the <coughs> unit which I talked with, the particular intelligence system, we had a nickname for them. We called it the Lama, much like the Lama in a monastery. The Dalai Lama. Yes, much mm -hmm. like the Dalai Lama, if you will. I asked them, well, wasn't the war in the past? They said, oh, yes, we had wars in the past. They said, that's long gone. I said, are there any armies, standing armies, or military operations, military organizations? None. No, no soldiers? No. No military? No. No Navy? No. No Air Force? No. Uh, no satellite system? He wouldn't answer that one. Uh, well, do you have means in case of something like an invasion from outside? Suppose somebody from outside wanted to come in and take over the planet. Do you have means of defending yourself? He said, yes, we do. He said, what are they? He said, that you do not have the need to know. But he says, we have means to defend the cities. Apparently, they had shall we say, built-in armaments, perhaps high-powered laser systems, perhaps more advanced systems. I don't know. I never found out. But they had the means to defend each individual city as such. And apparently it was never needed. What were the cities like? I mean, were they colorful? Were they large? Uh, were they comfortable? Some were large. Some were smaller. Uh, they were definitely very comfortable. The apartments one we were assigned to or live in were very comfortable. They had all the modern conveniences that we know today, plus some. Uh, food what, was, what, what would be different? What would be different as would a be, convenience that, say, we don't have right now? Yeah, you know, that uh, says I have to go back a bit to rem remember <laughs> that. Going back to the future, if you will. I hear you. They had synthetic food units, I remember, in the apartments. You could have fresh produce brought in, or you could synthesize either way you preferred. They did have restaurants, and there were, of course, stores to go shopping in. You could buy stuff if you wanted to buy, of course, as a misnomer. They did set up a limitation. In other words, if everything was free, a person could go out and literally grab anything they wanted. There had to be a limit against this sort of thing. You're literally purging a store of everything you had because you wanted it. They wanted this, 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 and this. There had to be a limitation. There was a form of credit which was a rather obscure type of credit system. It wouldn't be on a monetary credit basis, but depending on your position in the society, you were allowed to have a certain comfort level, if you will. Certain things you were allowed to have to buy, if you wanted to call it a buy, to go choir. And in terms of entertainment, they had entertainment, they had television, if I remember correctly now, they had radio of sorts. They had theater, they had many of the things which we have today, except they've been carried a little bit further. And they did have travel. You could travel to another city. They did have rail systems that covered, at least where I was in the United States. They had rail systems allegedly all over the planet, but they were not like we have them today. The rail systems were much wider. They were at least twice the width track-wise. The cars were two, two and a half times as wide. They were longer, and they were made out to be much more like an excursion trip, if you will, like you would go on an ocean liner on an excursion or on a uh, cruise.